Dr. Andrew Pedigree is a British historian at St. Andrews University in Scotland. His specialty is the history of the book and media transformations. He has written a great deal about the written word with an emphasis on libraries. His latest book is titled The Book at War, How Reading Shaped Conflict and Conflict Shaped Reading. In his introduction, Professor Pedigree writes, in all nations, once war broke out, writers and libraries were expected to play a full role in forging victory. After the Second World War, the Allies would face problems of how to sanitize or exploit the collections of the defeated. Dr. Andrew Pedigree, when did you first start reading? Um, I imagine I first started reading um, uh, about when I was four or five. Um, though um, I'm sure I had books in my hand before then. So what kind of a family did you grow up in and how significant was the book in your life in those early years? Um, well, my father was a land agent. Uh, he'd been um, a navigator on coastal command during the war. So although I wasn't born till 1957, I felt very much part of the war generation. Um, both my father and my mother lost their chance to go to university to, to the Second World War. And so they were absolutely uh, obsessed with education and basically spent every last penny they had in ensuring their five children all had a decent education. I was the fourth of five. All five of us went to university. So in a way, my parents got their wish, uh, but one generation later than themselves. How big an impact did the book have on you as you're going through your early years of education and on your way to university? Uh, I read fairly voraciously. Um, I read history. Um, I read uh, novels a, a great deal. And then I went to a secondary school which had a fantastic library. And in the last years of my education, I pretty much read my way around the English literature section. So I essentially read English literature for the fun and I read history books very largely uh, for work. Um, though it became increasingly fun as well, I have to say. What uh, two, three books or authors would you recommend to somebody based on your interest in them? Well, that changes all, all the time, but um, I, I would say that at the moment, I. There's no one I could recommend more highly than Jonathan Rose, who's a, a scholar in the United States and, and has read a def, a written a definitive book on the intellectual culture of the British working class, which must have been written 20 or 30 years ago, but is still going strong. Um, and he is a, he is, he is a, a fantastic scholar. Um, in terms of style and approach, I think my two um, favorite authors were both people I was lectured by at a university. One was Simon Sharma, who then gave a fascinating series of lectures on the art of the Dutch Republic in, in the 17th century. And Hugh Trevor Roper, whose um, most famous book at uh, the time was his a uh, book on the last days of Hitler. He had been an intelligence officer in the war. He was asked to go to Germany and verify that Hitler had died. And this was at a time when the Russians were um, trying to claim that maybe he wasn't quite so dead and they had uh, they had him in their custody. So, And it was a worldwide bestseller, this account of Hitler's last month and his demise but he was he was a wonderful stylist and what i learned from both sharma and trevor roper was that history is very largely a matter about trying to understand the period 
of history, of trying to understand that it is different from the present and that a good story draws your readers in. You're at St. Andrews. Tell us where that is in the world. Well, St. Andrews is uh, a small coastal town on the um, east coast of Scotland. It's a town of about um, 10,000 people, which doubles in size when the undergraduates are here. It has an ancient university. We are over 600 years old, which um, um, is now something of a, uh, a, a an, an elite university too it's in the last years it's uh it's become the first university to beat oxford and cambridge at the top of the ta best university guide table so we're very very proud of that achievement it's got a very strong tradition in the humanities and it's a wonderful place not only to live but also to have brought up my family um, I came here in 1986. I'm still here, and I will probably finish my career here. So I know you've had Americans in your classes. I've met too many that have gone to St. Andrews. Is there a difference, or what is the difference, between an American student and a British student? Well, that's a very interesting question. It was, was one when I, which I was conscious of when I first arrived here. Um, very conscious of it because St. Andrews wasn't as strong a university then that it is now. And I was always grateful to have Americans in my class because no Scot would say something like, I don't know much about this, but it occurs to me. And it was their willingness to speak out in classes that I most, most valued when a lot of my students were sort of heads down on the, uh, on the desk, not wishing not to be called. I have to say that students have just got better all round now, and we still have this diversity of places uh, they come from, probably even more. We have a lot of students from India now, um, some from Africa, a lot from the European continent. So the Americans are a large part uh, of a very good blend of different nationalities. What are the first couple of things you tell a student about the book from all of your education on this subject? About the book at war? No, about just the book, a book, and how, you read, book? And how you read. Well, I would tell them that you learn much more deeply if you have a physical book in hand rather than a digital surrogate. Um, I think the scholarly research is is um, just beginning to be done on that, but I think it's clear that there is something about where text appears on a page which fixes itself in the visual memory in a way that scrolling down um, of a, a digital version really doesn't. Uh, I would also tell them that there's never reading wasted there's an increasing tendency among students to wish to be pointed to a, a 10 page section in a book uh, 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 rather than the whole thing. And I, I try and tell them that, you know, deep learning uh, never goes astray, even if it doesn't reflect directly in an essay you're writing. It's, it's one of the things that Hugh Trevor Rope said to me on one of the rare occasions as an undergraduate, we, we talked one to one. And he said, a, a dissertation is like an iceberg. Nine tenths of it should be below the surface. And I thought I was very wise. When you read, what are your own requirements? What kind of an atmosphere do you like to be in? Um, I don't really need silence and I find being on my own in a sort of silent environment would actually hinder my writing particularly. Um, I quite often, you know, when I'm trying to formulate something for the first time, I go to a coffee shop where there are people around and I find somehow that uh, relaxes me. So whereas I love the 
uh, principle of a writer's retreat, I would never go on one. It would be like a short prison sentence for me. Um, so reading, um, again, I, I don't mind reading in company. Um, I'm not very good reading on a bus or a train uh, because I have residual motion sickness, but otherwise I can, I can pretty much read anywhere. I don't think I got this from your book, but because your book inspired me to get online and ask a couple of questions on about numbers. But I found that the, at least they say, the number one selling author in history is supposedly Agatha Christie, and she sold something like two billion books. When, mm -hmm. you, when you hear that, why do you think she's so popular in history? Well... I mean, I'm, I'm very surprised that she would ever be classified in that way because she's a, a detective writer who in her own day was writing about her own time. So she she was not in that respect even a, a, a historical novelist. She was writing mostly about contemporary uh, characters of her own invention. Um, I think she's very popular because she's a, she's, she writes beautifully um, and she has a, a, a very good style of plotting. Um, the plot always comes out in the end, and you don't feel you've been fooled by her leading you up uh, dead ends uh, a great deal. And also, like many um, very successful well, authors, she was extremely prolific, and she'd established a very clear brand. So if you get to the point where people will read anything that you write, you're obviously uh, in a very good condition. You talk about a lot of figures in history when you're writing in your book about war and the book at war. I want to ask you about Winston Churchill, who I found a number that said he's, he wrote 43 book-length works in 72 volumes. What about the book? What about the book and Winston Churchill, and how does it fit into your story in the book? Well, one of the things that, I mean, as you've probably seen, my, my book, The Book at War, does spend a lot of time talking about the Second World War, and certainly is predominantly about the wars of the 20th century. Um, that's because this was the first time in history when the troops um, were almost universally literate. So it's instead of treating them like uh, people who can just be ordered around, you had to take into account that they had to be uh, invested in the conflict in, in, in which they were fighting. Now, what I also recognized in doing this, that very unusually, most of the war leaders, Stalin, Hitler, Churchill, Charles de Gaulle even, were themselves um, established authors. So they knew the importance of the book in fighting war, in securing buy-in from their own populations, um, not just as an abstract thing, but because they were themselves highly important authors. Uh, Winston Churchill, for instance, um, had spent the 40 years uh, before he became prime minister, in effect, living from the income of his writings. So it was not just a preference in his life. It was, a, it was an urgent necessity in order to sustain his style, his style of living. What are the troops uh, in World War II or in World War I likely to have been found reading? And was there a difference between those two wars? There certainly was. There was a great difference. Um, education had proceeded considerably in, in the short interval between the two. In the First World War, I think troops were most likely to have been reading not so much in the trenches, which were obviously... Uh, terrible conditions for writing. But um, in the rest camps behind, they were mostly likely to have read um, their local papers. Um, in other words, the British troops tended not to read the national dailies because the reporting 
of those uh, papers was so hubristic and so detached from the real experience of the troops on the front line that they got pretty fed up with it. However, they would if they were in, let's say, a regiment from County Durham, and that's how the British Army was organised in those days, they would want to read their local paper. So supplying local papers to the front line was a major, um, major concern. By the time we get to the Second World War, we've had the paperback revolution. And so the two most important things, I think, were on the British side, uh, Penguin Books, uh, both modern novels in cheap editions, uh, which fitted very easily into the uh, pocket of their combat trousers um, and could be read and then disposed of. So that's the English uh, side. On, on the American side, they produced one of the most remarkable publishing feats of the war with the American service editions, which again were paperback, um, but now in a sort of landscape for, for format rather than an upright format, um, offering some non-fiction, some classics, but mostly modern fiction. And these were distributed to the American troops serving overseas free of charge. And they produced a thousand titles and something like 120 million copies, which were then shipped to American soldiers wherever they would be on a small Pacific atoll or fighting through the Bacage of Normandy. It was a most re remarkable effort of logistics as well as of publishing. You also wrote a book called The Library of Fragile History. Mm -hmm. What motivated you to do a book on libraries? Well, um, to, that was written with a, a, a young colleague at St. Andrews, uh, Arthur De Vader, and we've, we've written four books together. And the first of those was a study of the book culture of the Dutch Republic, um, which we called the Bookshop of the World because it was such a powerful phenomenon. Um, and what we discovered there through doing a lot of work with auction catalogues is that private collecting was one of the things which really motivated the publishing industry um, and also actually all through history has helped in the preservation of books, private libraries. And so we wondered uh, why this wasn't more of a phenomenon in the history of libraries as it had previously been written. Uh, you know the sort of book, the 50 great libraries of the world, you know, libraries you have to see before you die. And, by and large, those libraries are very unusual in the fact of their survival. Um, and the point we make in, in our history of libraries is that this um, cycle of growth, deterioration, disposal, and reconstitution is constant through history. It's not a factor of the digital age where there's some existential angst about the future of the library, uh, certainly the public library. It's just a normal part of the cycle of life as far as books are concerned. I mean, when you think of it, very few of us want to live our lives surrounded by our grandparents' uh, furniture or their choice of curtains. There's no real reason we should want to be burdened with their libraries either, which is why in the 17th century, auction sales of private libraries became such an important phenomenon of recycling books uh, to different owners. So what kind of a library do you have? Well, I'm sitting in part of it. Um, I would say if there's one thing that keeps um, me awake at night, it's the thought of what's going to happen to it. So I have made a dispositions now that the University of St. Andrews has undertaken to take any of my books that they don't already have. Um, my graduate students and colleagues will receive others of them. I'd say I've got about 5,000 books. I disposed of about 1,500 last year on subjects that I didn't think I'd be going to write another book about. But um, it's a, it's a hard habit to kick. You know, during the COVID lockdown, I probably bought online about 
a book every second day and with my wife also <laughs> stocking up that um so every time i come on to a new subject i'm now now beginning to work on a uh, history of uh, the newspapers in the 19th 20th century so i'm buying again for for a new pub uh, uh, a new project so mostly workbooks um gain my wife has a decent um library of uh, English literature so we did when we got married we certainly weeded out duplicates um, so I would say about 5,000 books at the moment back right after the wall came down in <clears throat> excuse me in Germany we did some programming over in Berlin and a monument that I will never forget was on Unter den Linden Street, as you walk down in the right, right in the eastern uh, part of the city, there is the empty library. Right outside the old State Opera, and as you know, in 1933, they burned a lot of books there. But if you look at this monument, it's you look at a piece of glass on the street. It's flush with the plaza and you look down into a bunch of white shells and they have no books on them. Have you been there? And even if you haven't been there, why do they have this monument today to the burning of books? Well, it was a very traumatic aspect of, of uh, German history. And um, I think it's a relatively recent memorializing because, of course, during um, the period between 1945 and, and 1989, that was part of the communist East German state, as was the old site of the, um, what in effect was the, uh, the Staatsbibliothek, what, what was in effect the, the, the National Library. Um, and that was very difficult because during the last years of the war, that library had sent all its books east to get away from the bombers coming from Americans and the uh, British side. Um, but that meant that when the borders were adjusted, none of those books were coming back. So you've got a situation where the residual books of the Staatsbibliothek were in the East, whereas the card catalog uh, was in the West. And neither would hand the other one back. So now they've all been reunited in one place. But of course, a great number of the books that made their way into libraries in Germany in the 1930s or 1940s were either in effect extorted from Jewish antiquarian dealers because they had no choice but to accept the miserable prices they were offered, or indeed um, they were taken from the houses of uh, Jewish families when they were sent off to the camps and to extermination. And many of those books are still in German libraries. Um, the period after 1945 was a period of forgetting. Um, and it's only really in the last 10, 15 years that German collections have began, sum to, uh, have began sum systematically addressing what they hold. Um, so the memorialization is a memorialization not just of what was lost uh, through these terrible deeds, but the sort of emptiness of the initial response to this problem. What motivated the students and the professors at Humboldt University, which is right across the street, to come over and help burn 20,000 books? And I understand there were book burnings all over Germany. Well, you know, in an ideal world, you, you would um, hope that uh, students and professors would be a beacon of light when hostile regimes are being established. But it doesn't prove to be the case historically. Um, students, professors, lawyers, clergy, judges, police are always among the first to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, when Hitler was on the verge of coming to power, someone said, well, you've got to 
you know, you've got to conciliate middle classes and have them on your side. He said, I will have no trouble with the middle classes. And that's how it proved. Um, the students were some of the most enthusiastic supporters of Nazism and were equally keen on dislodging uh, Jewish professors from their positions, not least because that meant a promotion uh, for some of the less able people who wanted to go into academic life who had struggled to get a position up, up till then. It's also the case that the German universities were very conservative institutions before that, so some of them quite sympathized with the hostility to the Weimar Republic that the, the, the Nazis had. So it wasn't a great surprise. The, the book burning itself was rather performative. Actually getting all these books out of libraries was more difficult because uh, the new regime uh, issued rather general instructions, the type of books that needed to be uh, removed. And you had to be a pretty skilled librarian to be able to work out, you know, which particular books were covered by that. Uh, it made a great impact on in the United States, which um, uh, led to counter demonstrations the very day that the book burnings took part, place. But in demonstrating, the uh, Americans might well have been forgetting that in 1917 and 1918, they removed all the German books from school and public libraries and burned some of them. So that this wasn't a purely German phenomenon. Joseph Goebbels, you say, wrote a novel called Michael back in uh -huh. 1927. Have you ever read it? And uh, how good a writer was he? Well, I haven't read it, but I, what I have done is I've looked at some of the uh, statistics of library borrowings. Now, public libraries had no chance, uh, no choice, but to take multiple copies of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, Rosenberg's uh, 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 attempt at contemporary history and, of course, Goebbels's novel. But whereas um, Rosenberg's impenetrable work uh, remained on the shelves for five long years, uh, Goebbels was actually quite frequently taken out and read. So I think the claim that he was um, uh, a novelist of some skill um, is, uh, bears up. What's uh, Hitler's relationship with the book? both his own relationship with Mein Kampf, but his attitude during the World War II, what to do about him? Well, he was a very bookish individual. Um, he read particularly history, and he was very interested in architecture. So his personal library, as uh, revealed at the end of the war when um, it was uh, removed from his, his property in, in, in Bavaria, um, you know, he was bookish, of course, being Hitler, he got given a lot of books too. And they have been an interesting study because some of them it's clear that he didn't make his way much beyond page 10 or didn't read them at all, but they were, they, they were sitting there. Um, mein Kampf was originally something of a publishing flop. Um, the first volume of two sold only 1,500 copies on its first publication, and the second volume would not have been published had it not been the case that the publisher was a fervent supporter of Hitler. And it's only really in 1933, as he's coming close to power, that sales begin to pick up. And um, actually, it's only in 39 when there's a full English translation of it, and it sold quite well in England and the United States, unrestricted by the government. They uh, thought, I think with some truth, that uh, the more people read Hitler, the more determined they would be to try and get rid of him. Something like nine to 12 million copies were sold of the, uh, of the German edition, sold or given away. A copy was given to every pair of German newlyweds to decor decorate their new marital home. But it may well be that it was a book more owned than read. 
during both World War I and World War II, who did the best job, meaning a country that did the best job of protecting books? Well, do you know, I would say Italy. Um, it, the Italians have an extraordinarily strong uh, bibliographical tradition and uh, of library training. And of course, they were vulnerable in both uh, wars to, to, to attack. And uh, by the Second World War, everyone was terrified of bombing. So it was the Italians who devised the protocols of to what library should save and what they should keep on their shelves. And as a result, uh, uh, only a tiny proportion of the magnificent book stock of Italy, particularly their early printed books, uh, was lost. It helps that they had a lot of hillside castles and medieval buildings where they, uh, the, the libraries could send their, um, their, their early printed books. So, so they did very well out of it problem for the German librarians was that if they sent their precious books away, uh, that might seem to indicate a lack of confidence in uh, the dictator uh, and his acolytes. So they were slow to send their books away. Um, and uh, that meant that, you know, they hadn't reached safe haven uh, by the end of the war. What about Great Britain, how did they handle the books? Because they had, as you uh, obviously, you know, the Blitz and the bombings in yeah. London. Well, they were slow. To, they were slow to 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 um, to take much action. Um, the The first priority was to deal with the more priceless objects in the British Museum and the priceless pictures in the National Gallery. There was a plan in place for them, and they were taken off to. Uh, depositories mostly in Wales, um, some dry salt mines. Um, eventually, and I think only after a raid uh, had damaged the uh, British Museum, which was where the British Library then was, uh, did they begin to send quantities of books away. And here, the fact that uh, the Bodleian Library in Oxford had had a new building with very deep stacks built, but he had, wasn't yet full of books. Um, so a lot of libraries took advantage of that to send some of their rarest materials there. I think by the end of the war, they were shielding <clears throat> the books of sort of 70 different libraries. They say that Mao Zedong's Little Red Book sold 100 million copies. Uh, what's your take on that? The the value of that little red book, what what importance did it have? Well, it was very important. Um, uh, I would say um, there were the, there was near a, a billion copies out mm. there by the time the residue was 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 destroyed. Um, it was first of all intended as a morale boosting uh, vehicle for the armed forces. And then it began being uh, distributed to the population in general. And then it began being translated into a myriad of different languages. It was important. I remember in my school days, um, as, a, as a youngster, it became known that if you sent a nice letter to the Chinese embassy in London, they'd send you a free copy. So the, at my school, there were lots of these little red books being waved about. I think they were more possessed than than read again in that case. Um, so, but they were very influential in just about any communist uh, movement of the 1960s and 1970s in the developing world that you you, you could mention. So they, it was a book that went around the world and certainly in terms of sales, it outdid any of the other second world, any of the second world war leaders. Jimmy Carter is one of our more prolific former presidents. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt wrote 35 books in his life. Woodrow Wilson, about 15. Of course, he was a professor at Princeton. But you point out in your book that FDR didn't write a book. No, I mean, I think FDR had an, a, a, an amazing turn of phrase and, and the ability to encapsulate an idea, uh, uh, an idea in a pithy expression. 
but he was more one for the, the, the fireside chat of his radio broadcasts. And also, by nature, he was more a journalist than an author. That's not to say he didn't value books. He was a book collector um, of, of uh, some uh, importance, and he, he put together a, a marvelous collection of, of, of maps and uh, nautical manuals, which he, he then gifted to, to, to the country. Um, so he knew how book, important books were and how important books were to the waging of war. Um, which, which is another very important point about the, uh, uh, his contemporaries, that they recognized that you couldn't anymore wage war without having the resources of research libraries to help you learn about your adversaries, to let you learn about the terrain where your soldiers might be um, uh, serving, and to understand the ideologies which had led to this sort of conflict. Where did you do your research on the book at war? What I mean, you tell us in the acknowledgments some of the places you went, but uh, give us some insight and in how you went about it. Well, this this was to a large extent a, a, a COVID book. I mean, I think some of this emanates from previous, you know, all the time I've been working on other projects, I've been, I, I think I've worked probably in about 300 different libraries worldwide, though uh, though often looking for different things at that time. But of course, that leaves a residue of material which you can use. What I did find is that whereas when I was working on 16th and 17th century sub subjects, um, there wasn't a lot of literature which you, you, you it's very difficult to buy contemporary books from that. A period and very expensive. Whereas putting together a collection of books published, particularly during the Second World War, wasn't difficult with digital bookshops and the quantities which were produced. So, for instance, I was able to buy a, a sample of the American service editions. I was able to buy probably 30 or 40 wartime penguins. Um, and of course, many of the interpretive books are also uh, not difficult to get your hands on. So although for much of the time uh, I was writing this book, we were in COVID lockdowns in the UK, I was still able to make pretty good progress um, through the things I could get sent to me um, um, through uh, digital purchases. The other thing I read a lot of was diaries. And that's a relatively copious feature of the Second World War, not least because of an organization called Mass Observation, which encouraged people to send in weekly or monthly reports of how they were getting on, basically. So I read those through um, largely to see how much mention they made of books. And that was really interesting, really interesting. Um, and you found that some not very bookish people were reading quite a lot. A lot of people in the armed services read for the first time. Prisoners of war, of course, read copiously uh, because there was very little else to do and um, would say afterwards that if there was one good thing that came out of being incarcerated of prisoner of war camps, it was the fact that they were able to read so intensively. On the other hand, many people who read regularly before the war were so busy in wartime, and that went for many women who took on so many extra responsibilities that they read less. So war completely, um, completely transforms uh, both the publishing industry and the nature of the reading people are doing. You have a picture, large picture on page 35 of Carl von Clausewitz. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because I thought it was important in this in, in this book to talk about books specifically about the art of war. Now, those go back a long way. Uh, you can trace their origins to the 6th century BC in a, uh, in a Chinese general called Sun Tzu, who was, uh, wrote one of the first manuals on 
uh, on how to wage war, and actually it's come back into some interest now. Um, but Clausewitz became very important because of the extraordinary success that the Prussian, that is German armies, had in the middle of the 19th century. Until that point, it had been all France, 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 because Napoleon was seen as the best battlefield uh, general of the modern period. So if you went to West Point in the 1830s and 40s, you'd see the shelves covered in with French books. And French was a compulsory subject um, if you were an officer cadet at West Point. It was only with this smashing series of of, of victories that the Prussians had over Denmark and then Austria and then finally France, that people began to think, where do they get this military brilliance from? And it's then that Klaus Clausewitz, 50 years after his death, became a pertinent factor in military strategy and in the teaching of uh, the war colleges such as Sandhurst in, in England. What's the story on mass observation? What is it? Mass observation is um, a government project which was set up um, right at the beginning of the war, if not a little earlier, um, in, intended as, as a sort of opinion polling of morale. And when the crisis of the war passed, uh, it was continued because the people running it was finding it, were finding it so interesting what people were writing in with to say about um, what what they were doing, all the new duties. Uh, and of course, on the home front, one of the most salient uh, emotions is anxiety. Virtually every household, and this will be the case, same in the United States, virtually every household will have a a son or a brother or a sister or a, a, a parent off at the war. It's something which is a common experience. And so um, although America wasn't much bombed, Britain was quite a lot bombed, they, they had this in common in that they all had people who were away from home. The normal dynamics of the family had been uh, up, upended by this war which meant that people took to diaries as a way of articulating these feelings when, they, when the people they would normally have talked their feelings through were often no longer there. And alas, all too many would never return. You mentioned Nella last. Mm -hmm. Who was she and uh, how did she fit into this story? Nella Last was a housewife in Barrow and Furness in, in Cumbria uh, on the northwest coast of England, which was then a major shipyard. So uh, it was a community which suffered a, quite a lot of bombing itself. Uh, Nella was a, a devoted reader, uh, self-educated, like many women of her generation. But when the war came, she also became a major diarist. She wrote something like two million words to mass observation during during the war. A uh, steady thousand words a night, would you believe? And it's a wonder she was a wonderful diarist. She has a very interesting story to tell about her family, relatives. She's very aware of social class and the subtle gradations of social class and what what marks out the socially aspirant hoping to move up from working class backgrounds to the moneyed people in the local community. But she was also transformed herself. She went and worked in a, uh, a, a, a one of the restaurants for the troops that sprang up everywhere. She started a, um, a, a shop for the Red Cross with other volunteers. She started a kitchen garden, which everyone in Britain was urged to do, so as to have to import less food. And she looked after her, her husband and cleaned the house and did everything, really. So her literary uh, efforts were now put into her diary rather than reading. Can so she scarcely mentions reading a book during the, 
six years of the war. Can somebody read her diary today easily? Like, for instance, if you live in the United States? Oh, the, yes. There are, I think, about four different volumes, um, which are excerpts from or, um, uh, or selections of one sort or another. Uh, two million words is really too, too much for a mass uh, audience book. However, they are all kept uh, very well in the U University of Sussex special collections. And so if you go onto the, the, into a browser and type mass observation Sussex, that will take you to the, or the website and you'll be able to find how you access a particular diary. And I imagine you'd be able to read all two million words if you were uh, a little younger than, than we are <laughs> and had, had time on your hand. So if you've been around the world to some 300 libraries, you got to give us uh, two or three that you favor. Well, you know, the two most important things about a library to, to a scholar like myself are the staff and what sort of a welcome they'll give you and the contents. Other things like architecture, quality of the seating aren't that important if the staff are prepared. I'll, I'll, I'll please to see you. Um, th this work started when we were doing a survey of French, French books from the 16th and 17th century. And um, libraries in France, uniquely really, their, their best collections of special, their, of old books, are in the town libraries, not the university libraries. And that's as a result of the French Revolution, when all the libraries of the rich and universities were confiscated, given to the city for the citizens to enjoy. Um, whether they enjoyed them is by no means clear when when you go to these libraries sometimes they bring you a book and when you open it it gives a great crack as if you're the first person in 200 years to be looking at it i think quite often you are but it really made a difference the staff and this can change with a with a change of generation but the staff sometimes uh were absolutely wonderful bringing hundreds of books out to whatever their rules said about how many they could deliver in a day the um, library in Aix-en-Provence was a particular favorite of mine. It was one of these new French media texts which have put aside the old public library model and himself have created a, a, a single space in which scholars can work, children can get the books they want, people can go and get a handful of romances for the following week. So from from grannies to, to three-year-olds. It's a community space, and they're absolutely wonderful. And sometimes we were finding ourselves actually reading 16th century books in the same room as the old veterans were reading magazines and newspapers. And one one occasion, someone one came over and, and slapped a, um, a, a newspaper, a, a magazine down on my desk and said, hmm, take this. You'll find this much more interesting. <laughs> He's probably right. <laughs> What's your own philosophy about once you've started a book, do you have to finish it? No. Um, particularly novels, give it 50 pages. I'm not enjoying it. Life's too short. When you're reading a book for, for work, you're very often actually not reading sequentially anyway. And Honestly, I don't necessarily expect when people are reading the library book or the Book of War or any of my other books, they start on page one and work their way through to the end. Um, when I'm reading a biography, I very often dip into the period of the writer's life, which I'm most interested in. And if, if they're a good writer, I do then go back to the beginning and read, uh, read what I've not read before. Um, but very few of the books historically only about 10 percent of the books that have been published 
since the invention of printing were intended for sequential reading. We regard it as the norm, but really it wasn't. So you have a statistic in the book that I wanted to ask you about, and that was, you say, on the eve of the Second World War, only 9% of the Soviets had a secondary education, and that in the United States we had 56 million radios, but the Soviets only had a million. Mm -hmm. what, what, did, what did that mean to you? Well, radio became crucial during the, the war, um, the story of radio in the U United States is a very interesting one because they were very early adopters of radio. Um, and they had to make two big decisions. One was whether, you know, radio hams were to be the future of radio or whether it was going to be broadcasting services. And they sensibly decided it would be broadcasting services. But unlike in the United Kingdom, where essentially radio was given a national monopoly, the BBC, in America they decided for competition. And so um, they possibly lost something in terms of quality. A lot of early radio was mostly uh, music and advertising, um, but they gained something in terms of range. Uh, and Americans and, and, and the British were very early adopters. They were quick to buy radio sets, which became the centerpiece of, of, of the home in a way that made people who valued print quite nervous at the time. Families were no longer sitting around the table, each with their separate books. They were now listening to the radio together. Likewise, in, in Britain, the newspaper barons got together to insist that the BBC was not permitted to broadcast news um, at least until a certain number of hours after the papers came out. Mm -hmm. And they weren't allowed mm -hmm. to discuss anything which might be discussed in Parliament in the next 14 days. So um, this, of course, by, went by the wayside in, in the Second World War because radio became the way that population followed news. Now, Russia, there weren't enough uh, radios. I think they even insisted that at one stage in the war that everyone hand in their privately owned radio. Uh, so instead, they provided a service of uh, loudspeakers uh, around the town from which the news could be broadcast. And a, a lot of those were in Moscow. And then this was still being used um, in China, for instance, in the 1960s. So the, you'd not only have your little red book, but you'd hear selected quotations of Mao being blared out all over the town through these loudspeakers. So radio was very important, but it was used in, in different ways and to different extents in the different comb combatant countries. And of course, in the occupied countries, let's say France and the Netherlands, you weren't allowed to listen uh, to the war, uh, to the radio at all. At the end of World War II, as the Russians came west, how did they treat books throughout that Eastern European area? And what was their philosophy of what it would, should be like in uh, their seg segment of uh, Berlin and, uh, and um, Germany? Um, I think their attitude was maximum punishment, maximum humiliation. As soon as they got onto German soil, they were determined that the Germans should pay for, for, for the awful, awful behavior of their troops in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia itself, where they destroyed virtually all of the institutions of culture, including all its libraries. So they had no scruples whatsoever in removing, even from its communist uh, part of Germany, uh, it, it, its sort of client state in East Germany, as many of the rare books as they chose, uh, as many of the ta as much of the technical literature they could get their hands on, and all of this was trained back to Moscow and Leningrad. And indeed, this was so much that it was 
some of it never even found its way into libraries. Uh, shortly after 1989, uh, they, they came across two million volumes of this war booty, which had simply been allowed to, to rot into one stinking mass in some former church. And even now, the Berlin State Library doesn't really know where all of its books are. Um, they have started noting uh, when a copy is known to be in Poland or library in, in Russia. But this humiliation strategy uh, extended also to private houses. So um, inhabitants would return to their houses after the, the first, uh, after fleeing away from the Russians and find total chaos. Uh, and often books having been um, uh, taken off their shelves, torn to bits, uh, simply to make the point that the Germans were not a civilized people and they had not behaved like a civilized people, so they could not expect to keep the accoutrements of civilization. What's the story of a man named Stephen Spender? It's, a, it's an odd story because Stephen Spender was a, a poet, a left-wing poet who had spent some time in Weimar Berlin with Christopher Isherhood and, and W.H. Auden. Uh, but whereas they went to America, he returned to Britain and he became a sort of fixture in everybody else's uh, story. He was uh, popping up everywhere, um, sent to examine librarians in Germany after the war to see if they were uh, Nazis or could be trusted in their positions. And he came back and be, became involved in magazine publishing. Turned out the magazine was being financed by the CIA, so that didn't go so well. And uh, eventually just became a grand old man of, of uh, English letters. Um, so longevity counts for a lot in public life. And Stephen Spender sort of outlived them all. A famous publication, if you've been in the military, is Stars and Stripes. And <clears throat> you point out that Stars and Stripes, the American publication that's been around for a long time, uh, had an impact on Winston Churchill. Yes, um, because it was so well resourced and so well organized, um, organized so that... Um, uh, a certain number of pages would be sent out from headquarters in Washington and New York, and then the local a edition could have two or three pages for its own local news. It, it was brilliant and you know, brilliantly illustrated and attracted some really significant uh, journalists to it, or people who would later become journalists. And Churchill said this and wrote a lot of notes, why don't we have anything like this? Um, because the... British for, uh, forces newspapers uh, had been a much more ad hoc development. Uh, started actually in the Scottish Orkney Islands, where the naval fleet had its um, refuge and had something like 60,000 service men and women stationed there during the Second World War. So they, they came up with a forces newspaper game called the Orkney Blast, which was... Uh, published once a week up there and is, is actually very professional. But you, you forces newspapers cropped up everywhere in every theater of war. Even journalists on a troop ship might start a ship newspaper just for the jury, duration of, of, of the voyage. But Stars and Stripes was in a different, different league in terms of its professionalism uh, and the, the journalistic values. Got to let you have your time back, but before we go, what? Uh, where were you born? What city? I was born in Real General Hospital in North Wales. My family moved to Shropshire where, when I was one, so I identify very much more with Shropshire than this accident of birth in, in North Wales. Where did you go to university? Where did you get your PhD? I went to a uh, university in Oxford and I stayed on to get my PhD there. And then I had two years in Hamburg as a postdoc, uh, two years in Cambridge 
and then up to St Andrews, 1986, where I've been ever since. When we started this conversation, you said that St Andrews is being judged as better than Oxford and Cambridge. What do they judge it on? Well, this is this is a special uh, survey. There's two or three newspapers which do an annual survey, which is essentially to, to assist students in their choices. So that has a range of uh, criteria, uh, teaching quality, um, student destinations, whether they succeed in getting jobs, student uh, satisfaction as recorded by themselves, uh, and retention rates. How many of the students that start with you uh, end with you? Now, this is it must be said, these are uh, metrics which favor us. Our students are incredibly generous about how much they enjoy being here, and something like 97% of those who start uh, finish their degree. So um, it's those it's those measurements which put us top uh, of the pile, and I don't think anyone in Oxford or Cambridge would agree that this makes us a better university. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly something I like to remind them of sometimes. Our guest has been Andrew Pedigree. He's a professor, as he says, at St Andrews University, and the book is called The Book at war and we thank you very much for uh, spending time with us it's been a real pleasure thanks for listening to the book notes plus podcast please rate and review book notes plus and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode questions or comments we would love to hear from you you can email us at podcasts at c-span.org Thank you.